God is so personal and loves us so much uh, to send Jesus to us. It's amazing. We are in a text this morning that is, uh, well, it's challenging because it's, it doesn't directly talk about the love of God. Uh, it talks about how the world has gone wrong. So uh, uh, listen, listen, listen to this word from, uh, from Romans chapter 1. I'll go ahead and begin with verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, has been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man or birds or animals or creeping things. Uh, okay, so, so it's one of the most well-known experiments in uh, the history of psychology. It's probably in, in, uh, in most, maybe even all, I don't know, but, but certainly in most uh, curriculums in, in psych, psych 101 classes. Uh, th there's a short video that is played, and uh, instructions are given to those to watch the video to count the basketballs. Uh, on the screen, there are six people who are dressed in white, and on the screen, there are six people who are dressed in black. And uh, each group has a basketball. They're kind of walking through the midst of each other, and they're, they're bouncing the basketball. So I actually was thinking about showing the video of it up here. The only thing is, is that the people who really own the rights to the video wants $150. So I thought, nah, I'll just talk about it. Okay? So, so, uh, but, but what happens is, is that they, they're bouncing the ball, right? And you, as who is someone who's watching the video, are supposed to count the number of you know, basketballs that are pe being passed. So there you are. You're watching it, and you're, you're supposed to watch the white group. So you keep your eye on the white group, and you count the basket, you know, one, two, three, in walks the gorilla, four, five, six, all the way to 15. Did you see the gorilla? Well, the amazing thing is, and I know what you're going to say. It's like, I would not miss the gorilla, right? You've got a gorilla walking in the midst of people who are throwing basketballs. But over half the people who, do, who watch the video and count the basketballs miss the gorilla walking right in the middle of it. Because we focus so much. We focus on what we're the task at hand. It's like when I drive my car. My wife is always telling me that, I, you know, I mean, when she, if she sees me driving, it's like almost impossible to get my attention, right? If she's like in another car or whatever. I've had people in my life tell me, man, did you never see me? Well, I'm focusing, you know. But anyway, this, this, ex this experiment tells us a, a couple of things. You know, one is it tells us that we just flat out miss miss a lot, of, a lot of things going around us. We're not that observant. Most of us are not that observant, or at least a large number of us are not that observant. And then secondly, we just don't even know what we're missing. Right? We, we, we miss so many things. We assume that we see more than we actually see. <clears throat> famous, famous experiment. This, this whole thing, this whole principle of the fa of fact that we're in general not very observant people. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are some more exceptions. But in general, not very observant people. This is the reason why, I, I suppose, one of the reasons why I like, you know, Mr. Monk so much. You'll, you know, I know that it's been off the air for a while and all this, and you maybe not even watch TV. But Mr. Monk is like this incredible detective. He sees all the details. I guess this is what good detectives do, right? Sherlock Holmes and so forth. But I like this guy. And he sees details that really other people don't see. Um, now, why do I go this direction? I go this direction because for a couple of reasons. One is, is that as Christians, we are, let's, let's be honest, we're, we are people of the Bible, right? They're always referred to throughout church history, we've always been referred to as people of the book. We are people who read and, yes, even study the Bible. That's what we do. Now, if you're one of those persons who haven't spent a lot of time in the Bible, it's okay. Uh, it's one of the things that we like to do here is to provide opportunities for people to get into the Word. Super important to us. Uh, we're a small church, so we don't have as many opportunities as maybe some really huge churches do. But we believe that we provide 
uh, as, well, we do provide as many opportunities as possible, and we faithfully teach the Word of God and help you see the details of Scripture. This is one thing that's, that's really important, okay? Uh, but also in terms of observation, we're not just focused so much just, all, you know, just, just on the Bible, as important as that is, but we're also focused upon uh, helping, uh, helping one another be observant of seeing God's presence, experiencing God in the world that we live. I mean, what good is it only to have this book? Remember, we always talk about the word being the living word, not only the written word, but this written word, as critical as it is, points to the living Christ who is in our midst. And if you go to work, don't you want to see Jesus in your midst? You know, if you're at home, don't you want to see Jesus in your midst? Don't you want to see the presence of God in your daily lives? When you brush your teeth and look in the mirror, don't you want to see Jesus in your midst? I hope there's a sense in which, a sense in which you see the love of Christ expressed on your own face, that God has already come to you and is, is living in you. I know I see, see Jesus when I see my friends. You know, we have a bunch of men who meet together on Friday mornings. I see the love of Christ. And this is a, there's a sense in which I see the presence of Christ in those men on Friday morning. On our Wednesday night group, I see Jesus Christ right there in the group praying together. I see Jesus Christ here in this place. When people walk in here, when they walk into the church, they walk into the, uh, what we call the foyers, the gathering area behind, this, behind the sanctuary here, people walk in, I hope that you see the love of Christ there. I hope that you experience this. And so it's just being able to pay attention to the details. We had a little girl, Linda brought in a little girl today. It was Jesus. Is Jesus not in her face? Jesus is there, right? So seeing Jesus in the details of life is the Bible, of course, in the details of life, okay? But here's, here's where I'm moving on this message this morning. It's that it's not just the Bible. It's not just the various details of life that, you know, day, on a daily day level. But here's what I really want us to see. I want us to see, and God wants us to see, Jesus more and more and more in our worship experience. And I'm talking corporate worship experience. And there's a sense in which worship happens all the time. When we talk about seeing the presence of Christ in our daily lives, there's a worship element to that because we are made to worship. But I'm also talking about seeing, the, the, <clears throat> seeing Jesus here in this place as we gather together as a congregation. Um, so, so, so this is the topic that I'm, that I'm talking about this morning. And actually, I'm going to be talking about it in a couple more weeks uh, in another sermon. I won't be here next week. Mike will be giving a message. But in a couple more weeks, I'm going to be giving essentially part two of this, uh, of this sermon. Okay, each one will be contained in a way that they all work to get. They work somewhat, you don't have to hear this message to understand number, the second part of it, but you know they do work together, I think. Anyway, so a, what I'm giving is a biblical, or what we might call simply a Christian understanding of worship. And I want to be extremely practical here in, in, uh, in this, in, in this uh, message. Uh, not, you know, not necessarily highly intellectual, you know, uh, not trying to use big words or these kinds of things. This is, should be very practical. In other words, what is our purpose here? What, you know, this, answering these, kind, these kinds of questions. You know, what does it mean for us to sing and, to, and together and to pray together? And, and, and what's Jesus' relationship to all this as we gather and do these, do these things? Okay? Uh, and, so, uh, and, and so let's back up a little bit and let's go, let's go back to Romans 1. Uh, looking at verses 8, first I'm going to just go ahead and read verses 18 through 21 again for context sake, because the verses that I'm really preaching on this morning is really a contrast to Christian worship. Before we can really understand Christian worship, it's helpful for us to see what non-Christian worship is about. What's the, what, what, are, what are human beings drawn to? So let's go back to verse 18. Are you with me on this? Let's go back to verse 18. I'm going to just read this again. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, has been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. See, I memorized this in the Revised Standard years ago, so I keep going back to that. I mean, the ESV isn't quite right at that way, but it's okay. okay. He goes on and says, They are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their senseless hearts 
or foolish hearts in the ESV, the foolish hearts were darkened. Okay, so I preached two sermons out of this, out of this material. Two sermons. Uh, today, we're coming to verses 22 and 23, and I'll touch upon up to through verse 25. So, so, so let's just go ahead and, and, and look at this again. It's, again, like I said, it's a marked contrast in terms of Christian worship. Notice what happens here, verse 22. Claiming to be wise, these people who are experiencing the wrath of God, the wrath of God being like, hear me out on this, like the left hand of God, the God, the God not to punish, but to get our attention. I talked in one sermon about the gospel of God being like the right hand of God, because it's the power of God for salvation. The left hand of God, you know, if we can just use this visual, the left hand of God kind of showing us, you know, that, hey, you need to repent. You need to change. You need to, get, bring your, you need to come to God. And then the gospel with the right hand of God. These people who are experiencing the wrath of God, okay, Paul says this about them. It says they claim to be wise. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And this is one of, the, one of the things that happens when you're in sin, right? Sin deceives you. You think that you're wise. You think that you're making good decisions. Reality is, is that you are not. And certainly in ter- from an eternal perspective, you're not making good decisions. You're making decisions for you, but God has a plan for your life that actually fills your life and makes sense to you. It actually begins to make sense. Claim to be wise, those who do not follow God, who are on their own, Calamity wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man or birds, or animals, or reptiles. That's RSV language, creeping things, ESV language, okay? So Paul is actually saying that the humanity, without, without God's help, humanity has missed the gorilla. You see the connection on the gorilla thing? Humanity has missed the gorilla. The gorilla is right in front of them. They miss it because they are focused on what? On their own lives, on their own selves so much. And let me ask you something. Do you know anybody out there who's really into me? Not me as in Pastor Paul, Paul Delashaw. Do you know anyone out there who's really into me, 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 me? You know what? I got to say it. I've seen it in my kids. They're great kids, but I've seen a little of the me, 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 me stuff, right? Right? Luke is great because when, when Luke was uh, growing up, we, we'd play games and stuff. And uh, Luke's my senior. He's a senior in high school at Kalama. And he's back there filming this. But anyway, Luke was, uh, he loved to win the game. You know, he's like really into winning the game. Like, I mean, and you won last night, didn't you? Yes, you did. Yeah, you, we won last night. Well, when, you, when he was uh, eight years old, if he didn't win, he went crazy. He was all upset. I want to win. I need to win. Me, 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 me. He's come, come a long way since then. But you got the idea, right? We're naturally into ourselves. That's just the way it is, okay? So, um, so humanity misses the main point, right? We miss the point that, hey, maybe all of life is not about me. Maybe life is also about something else. But we focus so much on ourselves. So claiming to be wise, they became fools, Paul says, uh, and there's so much I could say about that, but I'm not going to for sake of time. So much more I could say about that. What is it that they've missed? Okay, They've missed this one thing more above everything else. They've missed uh, that human life, it is about others, not, our, not me, but it is about others. But at its core, it's about worshiping the Creator. That's what human life's about, worshiping the Creator. I, you know, I think when I was growing up, people always thought it was weird. Because I, you know, even when I was young, I was like, man, I, w- I want to I wanna know God. Human life is about knowing God. It's about worshiping God. I know this is going to sound radical to a lot of people in the world, but we were made for worship. We're, we're never going to be satisfied. We're never going to be filled up. We're never going to be at peace in our lives. We'll always have restless hearts until we worship. God's made us to worship regularly. Let me ask you this. What do you think you will do? What do we think we will do when we go to heaven? When Christ comes back and restores the earth 
And we're in the new age of heaven and earth meeting one another. So I'm sometimes a little uncomfortable just saying go to heaven because there's more to, more to the second coming of Christ than that. But when, but when heaven and earth meet, what do you think we're going to be doing for eternity? I don't know. I mean, I think some young people think they're going to be playing video games, right? You know? I mean, uh, I know that I'm going to be watching college football, right? I mean, because I'm really into that or whatever. Or maybe my garden, right? God's going to give me a garden to grow. Well, actually, that could happen. Yeah, I could totally see that. But what are we really going to be doing? We are going to be worshiping. I mean, that is what this is about. So, so in fact, I think I put it on the screen. Did I put, did I put Revelation 5, 11 on the screen? So Revelation chapters 4 and 5 are the great worship chapters of the book of Revelation. I mean, the whole, really, the whole book is worship-centered. But 4 and 5 are about the worship. And at the end of chapter 5, just get the idea. Just, just let me just, just walk through this with me just for a minute. This is about our eternity. This is really about us. It says, Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And by the way, the elders are the church. I have to spend a lot of time, it takes another sermon, another message to be able to, to explain that. But the elders are the church. That's you and I there. The elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb... Be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures, which represent the, the created order, four living creatures said amen. And the elders, the church, you see, what did they do? They fell down and worshiped. And that is what we are going to be doing for eternity. So if you don't like worship, I'm telling you, you're in trouble. Right? I mean, right? Right? Anyone here ever read C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce? Okay, well, those who have know what I'm talking about. If you haven't read it, go out and get it. Go out and get it and read it. Because people who are not going to be in heaven, they don't really want to be there. They don't really want to be there. And, and boy, if, if, if I ever taught the book of Revelation, you'd see how true that is. But they don't want to be there. But the point is, is that we are made for worship. It's the only way that we're ever going to be complete. Okay? So, Going back to Romans, going back to Romans. Verse 23 is worship language. That's what it is. Okay? Verse 23 says, and, that is they, those who are experiencing the wrath of God, those who are living in, um, really in a, in a state of sin, right? They exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Uh, in other words, they worship these things, these images that resembled these various creatures. You see, now if you look at human history, this is exactly what people have done for centuries. Paul knew all about this. He lived in an age where he literally he saw these things. He would go to places. You remember, Paul is the great the great missionary to the Gentile world, and he would go and he would see people worshiping these very things. You see. And these cultures uh, worshipped images of human beings, images of reptiles, images of animals, images of birds, these kinds of things. They worshipped them in order to get their attention and to manipulate them and get control over them. This is really important because in that world, you could not really, I mean, when those who did not know about, about God, as in the transcendent Hebrew God, those people saw God as being in the midst of, really they were plural, the gods, being in the midst of reality. And the only way that they were going to get control over those gods is to be able to do acts of worship, magic and rituals and so forth, in order to get control over them so that they would be able to you know, uh, live. Because this, this, this really takes a whole course on, on the worship of the ancient Near East. But the point is, is that is that, I'll just keep it super simple, you could not walk on down to KSC and get, you know, a gallon of milk, right? Kalamas, Kalama uh, Shopping Center, KSC. Yeah, do remember that one, KSC. You live in Kalama, it's KSC, right? All right, good. Some of you are going, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, it is, you know? You couldn't go down to the burger bar and get a burger. I mean, it just didn't exist, right? 
So you, what have to do? What do you have to do? You had to worship these various things in order, hopefully, to get to get some measure of control over them, and then they would turn around and bless you. This is the way worship worked in the ancient ancient world. Okay. Um, Again, it would take a whole course to, to really explain this. But the point is, is that love and faithfulness have nothing to do with this belief system. It's all about getting what I want. It's about me, 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 me for my benefit. That's what it is. So Paul, in verse 23 of chapter 1, is giving us worship language. That's what he's doing. He's telling us about worship without God. Let me ask you this. Do you know anyone today? who's trying to control and manipulate their world so that they earn a little cash? See that goes on? See, people just, that's what, they're, that's what the world's about, right? How can I get control over my environment so that my environment makes me wealthy? How can I get control over that woman or that guy in order for him or for, he, for her to do what I want her to do? got to find a way to control her. I got to find a way to control him. And, they, and what, what do you do? You, ultimately, you manipulate. You have to. There's really no other way. We have to manipulate. Now, I'm talking about outside of God's help, right? Outside of God's help. All right. So, so, ver, so, so verse 23 talks about, I'll give you a couple of details on this. I hope you're okay with staying a little bit longer because there's so much good stuff in here. Um, Verse 23, it, it talks about glory. So they exchanged the glory of the immortal God. Okay. So, so glory is a super important word in the Bible. Um, we think of glory as like a radiance or a reflection of, of God's greatness. But here's the truth. This is, this, is the way that they, this is the way first century Christians thought and the way the Hebrews thought. Everything has a glory. It makes sense, right? Everything has a glory. The sun has a glory. The ocean has a glory. Uh, Richard has a glory, okay? All right, I see glory coming off you. And it's true. Uh, everyone here has a glory. Uh, my dog has a glory, right? Everything has a glory. I know that your dog has a glory. Sweet little doggy that you have, right? I know that. I know their dog. Yeah, really good, really good little, little, little puppy. Anyway, uh, everything has a glory. So God has a glory. And what is God's glory? God's glory is this. Love, grace, mercy, faithfulness, goodness, right? God's glory is that of everything that you want God to be. <laughs> That's who he is. He's not, I'm not talking about Santa Claus. I'm talking about one who loves you, one who loves the world. God has a glory. But what does verse 23 tell us? These people have exchanged the glory of what? God, who is faithful, who is loving, who you can depend upon, who cares for you, who's willing to forgive you, who wants to give you the big hug, right? Who wants to be your friend as well as your, 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 your father. They have exchanged that glory, that nature, because it's really what has to do with someone's nature. They exchanged that nature for what? These other things, right? These other things cannot help you. But that's what they've done, right? Let's put it to you this way. I've got a couple of images here. It's like, and I did this because last week there was a couple of Trekkies in here, and I just, I was going to ride that wave a little bit. So, so there was, so, so, so uh, I got a, a chuckle on the Trekkie thing. So there's a Trekkie, so there's a, it's like changing the, uh, exchanging the Enterprise for someone who rides a bike, right? That's what I came up with. I mean, but that's kind of what it is, right? I mean, it's like, I got this great spaceship, but I'd rather try to do it all myself, right? It's like changing Spock. Yes. I really ran with this one. I was thinking of other images. I, th I went with the Trekkie thing. Some of you are like going, oh man, our pastor is ridiculous. Well, maybe so. All right? I told you I'm a little weird. But it's like it's changing Spock for this thing. who kind of has the Spock, the Spock thing, right? You know, the ears and all that, right? It's like it's changing. Now, come on. Would you rather hang out with Spock or hang out with this cat? I mean, I'm going Spock every time. But there are people who go, hey, give me the cat. Give me the cat. We well, you know what's kind of, what kind of people those are. Those are kind of weird. Anyway, <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Okay, so obviously we know better, right? We know better. So uh, the Apostle Paul tells us that humanity has exchanged. They've traded in something, some imaginal joy, for actually, for things that bring problems, for death and decay. As I talked about last week, plan B, for those of you who heard that message. Okay, so uh, there's, there's also wanted to point out something else about, can you go to the next slide? 
I want to tell you something else about, about this. Okay? Notice I highlighted immortal and mortal. Another Bible study thing. There's a reason why Paul uses those two words here. Because what is immortality? Well, it's living forever, right? You're not going to die. But what have they exchanged this glory for? This glory of God who is forever and ever and ever. Who loves you forever and ever and ever. Who's faithful forever and ever and ever. Who's merciful forever and ever and ever. What have they exchanged? They've exchanged that for mortality. They're worshiping things that die. That have limited time. In other words, Paul's saying that they exchanged the living God for death. That's what they've done. It's crazy. It's insane. And yet, this is exactly what humanity has done. Uh, one of the larger points here is that people who are, uh, whatever people worship, they become like. If you worship those things that are filled with decay, as in anything of this world, because we all are decayed or decaying, we get exactly what we ask for. We become like that what we worship. If we worship God, the living God, the immortal God, then guess what we get? Immortality in Jesus Christ. We become like what we worship. Um, I was going to show you Genesis 1, uh, 26 to 28 again. But I'm not going to do that. Just remember this. That, uh, go ahead and throw that slide up there real quick. God has made us in his image that we would worship him and remain in that image. Okay? Uh, but we, we've exchanged all this. Right? That's why uh, in this passage, which the world hates, by the way, the world hates this passage. This is the most unpopular passage in our culture that there is in the entire Bible. The end of chapter 1 of Romans. The most unpopular. Right? Paul, you're being so judgmental. And I'll show you why. The reality is, is that Paul is saying that from God's point of view, he just gives us whatever we want. You want, you, you want these things? You can have these things. You want these things? You can be like this. This is why, look, at these, look at these words. Look at these words. Verse 24, Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. And he goes on. I mean, that's basically what God's saying is, hey, hey, just let, them, let worship have its full effect on people. They're going to worship. Everyone worships. Let worship have its full effect on people. Look at verse 26. And I've got to read this, this passage. It says, for, the reason, for, for this reason, God gave them up to this honorable passion. passion. Their women exchanged natural relations, i.e. relations with men, for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passions for one another. This is obviously homosexuality. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in their persons the due penalty for their error. Verse 28, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gives them what they want. God gives them up. See, God's not the big, big judge who's trying to destroy people's lives. He's trying to help people. But since they did not fit, see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up. said, okay, go ahead, go for it. To a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manners of unrighteousness, evil, covetous, malice. They are filled of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, uh, insolent haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. You like that one? Disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree, that is God's decree that is good for them, God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. Oh, this is so great. This is so great. You're so brave now that you're, you know, you're practicing homosexuality. Now, I know this is very difficult, very, very difficult material in this culture. I have, a word for, I have a word for you here. The church is called to be prophetic. It simply is. 
we cannot simply go, oh, you know what, I know you like to do all these things, and so you're okay, and I know, okay, that's all right, we love you, and so forth. We do love you. But the church is called to be prophetic. And the way that we live has an impact on who we are. You want to worship these things? Let worship have its full effect. We'll see how you do with that. And so the world's full of, full of decay. It's full of unhappiness. It's full of, you know, it's full of difficult, just really horrible things. So, you know, I mean, this also, this also ends up contributing to crazy, crazy things. Crazy things, you know? I mean, um, ultimately, it gets into things like, you know, where people become violent. Right? God just says, look, you want to worship these things. You want your life to be about these things, then I'm just going to turn you over to them, and you're not going to like it. Because I love you. Won't you come back to me? Won't you come to me? I made you. Come to me. Honor me. Be thankful. Come on. Honor me. Be thankful for the things I've given you. Okay. So, I know what the world's, world's going to say and that what people will say when they see this video online about these words, but it doesn't matter all the proclaim the truth. So what then is Christian worship? It's not about manipulation. It's not about controlling others. It's not about doing something for God to get him to be happy with us. It's not even about that. Christian worship, biblical worship, is the giving up of control, of our own control and the giving up of our lives into the hands of Jesus Christ. I'm going to say that again. Christian worship is the giving up of our control and the giving up of our lives into the hands of Jesus Christ. So when we come together on Sunday morning, we say, yes, Jesus, thy will be done. Yes, sometimes, Lord, your words, they are difficult to understand, and, and sometimes I don't even want to hear some of these things, but you're holy, and you're loving, and I say yes to your words. I say yes to you. I, this is foundational. This is where worship begins, with a heart that is surrendered to God's will. The most important part of worship, in my opinion, is exactly that. Let's pray. Father, this morning we are thankful that you have shown us a way that actually is uh, for us. Even though we're me, 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 me centered. And the reality is, is that when we are entirely me, me, me centered, we've missed the gorilla. We've missed the thing that life's about. And Lord, we're sorry. We're sorry that so often we've come to you thinking that we can control you or manipulate you or do something to get you to be pleased with us. The reality is, Lord, is that you love us already. You just want us to be in relationship with you, but that means also that we have to just say yes to you. I ask, Lord, that you would make this a yes church, a yes to Jesus, that we could truly pray, pray the Lord's prayer, which talks about your will being done. And so this morning, we're going to end our service in a little bit different way. We're going to pray the Lord's Prayer together. And we'll just end the service that way, Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.